And my talk will be about the consequences I think um, I would like to draw from uh, a major um, political theoretical intervention into the debates of the left, which was, of course, um, Ernesto Laclos and Chantal Mousse's publication of Hegemony and Social Strategy in 1985. And I will first, in the talk, sort of lay out the four, I think, important shifts that were generated by this book, and then um, go on uh, and try to present where I think uh, certain directions could be followed from there. So the publication of this book triggered a series of significant transformations of both political and theoretical debates on the left. Looking back at these debates, it is possible to detect at least four reasons for the book's impact. First of all, hegemony and socialist strategy transformed the very presuppositions of the Marxist problematic. By putting the Gramscian tradition and the category of hegemony center stage, Laclau and Mouffe were able to undermine the deterministic assumptions of more traditional versions of Marxism. The category of hegemony allowed them to dismantle the Marxist dichotomy between economic base and political ideological superstructure. Furthermore, by radicalizing the Gramscian concept of hegemony, the latter turned into a name for the general logic of the political institution of the social. As a consequence of this move, the realm of politics was significantly extended Politics, or rather the political, began to refer to the institution of the social as such. Which brings me to the second shift initiated by hegemony and socialist strategy. For if the political is primary and constitutive of the social and not derivable from any other instance, then no social actor is able to lay claim to a privileged position in society. Hence, Class, as a political actor, loses its ontological privilege. Instead, we have to confront the phenomenon of a potentially endless chain of social actors forming their identities around notions other than class, such as gender, race, ethnicity or sexual orientation. Here we encounter Laclau and Mouffe's contribution to new social movement theory. From the hegemony theory perspective, they saw the need for a common articulation of these diverse struggles, and they responded to this problem by proposing, in the last chapter of the book, the project of a radical and plural democracy. Thirdly, hegemony and socialist strategy contributed to the discursive term within the social sciences. Insofar as social identity loses all points of anchorage in an allegedly deeper reality, identity is the outcome of a discursive articulation. In this way, the social as such is entirely reconceptualized by Laclau and Mouffe in terms of discursivity. Most importantly, in my view, the discursive mechanism of identity formation is explained by the highly original concept of antagonism. Only by introducing antagonism, it is possible to explain how discursive differences become homogenized into a chain of equivalence vis-à-vis -vis a purely negative outside. This brings me to the fourth important shift initiated by hegemony and socialist strategy, what one could call a decisive displacement of post-structuralist thought. Obviously, their skepticism about whether such a thing as society as a closed totality can exist is shared with many strands of post-structuralism. But with hegemony and socialist strategy, post-structuralist thought was if not for the first time, then definitely in the most coherent way, extensively employed as a tool for political analysis in the strict sense. And while initially Laclau and Mouffe's overall strategy in this book can be described as deconstructive in many respects, 
In their later work, they developed an increasing interest in Lacanianism and psychoanalysis in general. Now, I take it that much of this is well known in the context of our conference. Nevertheless, I would like in my presentation to point out a series of consequences that appear to me of crucial importance for political and social analysis. And I would like to spell out these consequences with regards to three fields, social ontology, politics, that is the concept of politics, and democratic theory. Let me begin with the ontological implications of hegemony theory. My claim is that hegemony theory, understood as a theory of discursivity or as discourse theory, provides us with a general social ontology, not only a theory of political signification. The logic of discourse, initially worked out in hegemony and socialist strategy and later elaborated by Laclau, covers as Laclau explicitly states in Emancipations, language and by extension all signifying systems. If this is the case, it seems to be difficult to maintain that the job can be done by a regional theory of political signification only. It would certainly require a general theory of signification. To be more precise, what is developed, for instance, in Laclau's paper on the empty signifier, is a quasi-transcendental argument as to the possibility of signification as such. But this means that discourse theory is not a theory of political signification, but a political theory of signification. The whole argument points in this direction. If, following Saussure, a certain degree of systematicity is necessary in order for a certain degree of meaning to arise, and if that systematicity of a system of differences can only be guaranteed by a limit which is not by nature differential but antagonistic, then it follows that we will not have any meaning without at least some form of antagonism some degree of antagonization. So while the argument as to a radical antagonistic limit certainly has a political background, it applies to all forms of meaning and signification, not only to political ones. Antagonism is necessary for the construction or stabilization of all meaning. If this is the case, so and if antagonism is but another name for the political, then all meaning is, at its roots, political. Therefore, Laclau can say, quote, when we speak of politics here, we are not referring to any regional category. Politics is an ontological category, end of quote. Now, it seems to me that the radical implications of this argument have either been overlooked or downplayed. Yet the consequences of the argument lead us to something of the order of a political ontology of the social, provided that by ontology we understand the science of being qua being, and by a political ontology the science of social being qua the political. For this reason, the political, from a hegemony theory point of view, is not a regional category, but an ontological one. And the same may be said about all the other discourse theoretical categories, including those of psychoanalytical lineage, that are turned from a hegemony theory perspective into categories of both ontological and political nature. For instance, the category of the subject, a category as ontologically necessary for hegemony theory as the category of antagonism. To quote Laclau again, when we speak of politics, we are not referring to any regional category. Politics is an ontological category. There is politics because there is subversion and dislocation of the social. This means that any subject is by definition political. End of quote. However, I would submit that in order to avoid confusion, it is recommendable to make a conceptual difference between politics and the political. 
Of course, the sedimentations of the social are political in the sense of being grounded on an instituting and antagonistic moment, which is the moment of the political in a radical ontological sense, only that this moment has been forgotten. The term politics, on the other hand, would then simply refer to the fact that a certain event is constructed in a political language, in an ontic, if you wish, sense. But of course, the ontological meaning of the political remains intact as the, let's say, secret truth of the social. This differentiation between politics and the political, or la politique and le politique, is of course rather common in post-structuralist contexts. In the 1980s, it re-emerged when many philosophers, among them Lyotard, Lefort, Badiou, Rancière and Panibar, were invited by Jean-Luc Nancy and Philippe Lacoulabart to give lectures at the Center for Philosophical Research on the Political. From what I have said so far, it should be evident that this is not only a philological question. What is at stake with this difference between politics and the political is the very way in which we imagine our political and social universe. In order to tease out these consequences, one first has to gain a clear sense of the very status of this difference and of the reasons for its emergence. And here we immediately register the uncanny resemblance of the political difference to Heidegger's ontological difference. The difference between an ontic realm of beings, in our case realm of politics as we know it, and the ontological realm of being in metaphysics that would be logos, idea, substance or ground. Heidegger's claim is that metaphysics has always differentiated between beings and being, yet this difference has never come into view as difference. Similarly, we have to say that in contemporary political thought there is frequent use made of the political difference between la and le politique, but rarely is it asked what we have to make of this difference as difference. So why was a need felt in political thought to introduce that difference? My suspicion is that the political difference emerged out of a historical conjuncture where it was increasingly realized that neither can our social world be based on a firm ground or ultimate principle, nor is it entirely without any ground or principle. So we are not living in a void. Rather, it is based on what Judith Butler calls contingent foundations. These foundations will always be plural, always established only temporarily. They can be reversed and they have to be established against conflicting foundational attempts. It, it makes sense, therefore, to describe theories that register the contingent and yet necessary nature of social foundations as post-foundational rather than simply anti-foundational. And to the extent that our conventional notion of politics would be too narrow to account for this process of contingent grounding of all social relations, the political difference had to be introduced. As it was felt, we would need a broader concept in order to account for the more fundamental function of grounding or reinstituting a world whose grounds had become fungible. At the same time, if we retain the Heideggerian perspective, the process of grounding can never be put to a halt, given that all grounds are contingent and temporary. If for Heidegger the ontological never appears as such, if it always recedes and still intertwines with the ontic, this is because the differential play between the ontological and the ontic never stops. And don't we have to assume a similar relation between the political and politics? Isn't the political understood as the grounding or instituting moment of the social constantly in search for its ontic actualization via politics? Isn't politics on the other side necessarily touched by the political without ever merging with it? Because then a firm ground would have been reached. However, even post-foundationalists who are prepared to agree on the differential nature of politics and the political may still ask, so what? Are you not playing around with abstract concepts? that have no, nothing to do with our social reality? And if not, what follows from the political difference? And here I would like to come 
to the second important consequence of hegemony theory, the first being hegemony theory providing us with a political ontology of the social. So I would like to come to the second important consequence, this time regarding democratic theory. Of course, the question what follows is a tricky question. From a post-foundational stance, of course, and a hegemony theory in particular, nothing follows with necessity from the differential play between politics and the political. This would only be the case, something only follows if an ultimate ground had been found, and this option was excluded from the beginning. Hence, whatever consequences we draw, they will not be necessary consequences. They will only plausible consequences. They have to stand the less than super hard test of plausibility when confronted both with the philosophical world of arguments and with the phenomenal world of politics. So, against what I would like to call the new anti-democrats among post-foundationalists, most prominently Slavoj Žižek and Alain Badiou, I would also include the Invisible Committee uh, at that point, I would defend the idea of democracy as a regime adequate to our post-foundational condition provided by the name democracy we understand the meeting point between a political and an ethical logic. And here, of course, I connect to what has been developed as an ethics of democracy uh, by Slavoj Žižek and I think unaccount is unaccounted uh, lead prefigured by uh, Claude Lefort and then also by Yanis Stavrakakis, for instance, and Shota Move. But supplementing Move's democratic paradox, the paradox between liberty and equality, I will be arguing that the long forgotten concept of solidarity, of solidarity can be located at this meeting point between the political and the ethical. So, if we recognize the differential play between politics and the political, as something of the order of a, concept, a conceptual symptom of the ultimately groundless nature of the social, then it is evident that it would be a non sequitur to see in such ultimate groundlessness the feature of a particular political regime, say, of democracy. It is an ontological condition rather than the condition of a particular ontic politics. If this is the case, the groundless nature of the social may very well characterize all regimes and is not a privilege of democratic societies. Consequently, the specific difference between democracy and any other regime does not lie in the fact that one will have to cope with the irresolvable contingency of social affairs, which is the case for every regime. Every regime have to, has to cope with the fact that an ultimate ground is not available. We have to look for it in the different ways in which regimes relate to this fact. While in some, the absence of an ultimate ground is negated, repressed, or disavowed, in democracy, this absence is institutionally accepted, even promoted. An argument made, as I see it, first by Claude Lefort. For this reason, it makes sense to define as democratic those symbolic arrangements of a given society which help to accept the ultimate failure of any attempt at grounding this very society, thus bringing to presence the very absence of an ultimate ground. Democracy openly turns the failure of foundation into its very own ground. It is not the war machine of capitalo parliamentarism, as Badiou claims. Rather, it is an ethical exigency by which politics is not only confronted with contingency, but forced to accept contingency as necessary. Why does it make sense to call this condition ethical? I submit it makes sense because it is precisely not political. It necessarily interrupts the logic of grounding and in actual fact impedes political action. In politics, I think we are all foundationalists. That is to say, we all seek to lay new grounds to institute the social, and we do not seek to doubt our own capacity to do so. So we become metaphysicists. To democratically accept the groundlessness of our own actions, hence, means to undermine the basis of these very actions. 
Hence, democracy is in the strict sense unpolitical, to use Roberto Esposito's concept of the unpolitical as that which is not anti-political, nor is it political, but is simply the obverse side of the political. However, and here the next problem kicks in, democracy as a particular and historically defined way of instituting the social cannot, on the other hand, evade the necessity of foundation. Even as it remains ungroundable in the last instance, it still has to be grounded time and again, at least provisionally. We are therefore confronted with an antinomy. On the one hand, in democracy, the impossibility of a final foundation is institutionally accepted, and hence the impossibility of realizing the democratic project once and for all is institutionally accepted. On the other hand, the democratic regime is forced to supplement with contingent foundations a ground which remains absent. In this sense, the second sense, democracy is a political project like any other. It emerges historically from social struggles. It has to be implemented against resistance and against powerful enemies. And its crumbling foundations have to be reassembled and reinstituted constantly if it is to have a future. If this is the case, the same institutions, the same institutions which are supposed to ground democracy, have also to signal the impossibility of instituting, of grounding democracy. In other words, Democracy, or a politics of democratization, emerges, on the one hand, out of a political project that aims at hegemonically overcoming rival projects and instituting itself in the field of politics. Yet, on the other hand, the democratic project is in constant danger of self-subversion, of deliberately undermining the very foundation it seeks to institute, and of opening potential inroads for anti-democratic attacks. One thing should have become clear from this argument, the democratic ethics of the unpolitical is not an unpolitical ethics. It is nothing less than a political ethics. Otherwise, we would let loose of the political end of the antinomy, thus running the danger to ideologically ethicize politics. A democratic ethics has to be inscribed into the flesh of the social, politically, and this can only be done through a political project to take up, like and Move, of radical democratization. Therefore, there is an activist component involved in democratic politics and in the ethics of democracy. And there is a political concept which could live up to the task by providing a sort of missing link between the ethical side of accepting the ungroundable nature of democracy and the political side of radicalizing democracy. And this concept is the concept of solidarity. In fact, the notion of solidarity, which is long forgotten, actually, in political theory, the notion of solidarity does not belong to either of the two traditions of egalitarianism or liberalism, so of egalitarianism or liberalism, which in post-foundational democratic thought tend to be paradoxically combined. In its classical rendering as fraternity, it brought a more communitarian component into political discourse. For a long time, solidarity referred to a mutual bond within a given social group or community. Solidarity among those similar to each other. A democratic notion of solidarity, however, runs counter to this idea. It has a built-in dimension of what I would call self-alienation. From a post-foundational perspective, the term makes sense only where one declares oneself in solidarity with others who are not already part of the same community. Just think of the case of, of, of the historical, worldwide solidarity with the anti-apartheid struggle of the ANC, of people worldwide who were not in the position you know, of black victims of apartheid. And still there is a possibility of solidarity. An important consequence follows. In order to establish a relation of solidarity with someone who precisely does not share my own position, 
I will have to at least partially disidentify with my own position and my own identity. I have to desolidarize myself from the community to which I belong. From the perspective of this community, solidarity with someone outside its borders will always be suspicious. It will always be considered a form of treason because it means to further and promote foreign interests, interests which may run counter to those of my own community. This is precisely the reason why solidarity cannot be an entirely political concept and why it keeps contact with the realm of the unpolitical and the ethical. It implies, it implies that one's own political project should be open towards heterogeneous demands, an openness which may undermine the vigor of one's project and may force the latter to deviate from its course. In this sense, we may have found in the concept of solidarity a precarious link between the ethical and the political. As a political concept, solidarity still registers an ethical demand for self-alienation, for degrounding one's own identity, and translates that demand into the language of political demands. My discussion of solidarity, I hope, has shown that a democratic ethics, when implemented politically, is far from being the harmless and conformist affair as it is portrayed by the new anti-democrats, for instance by Zizek, after his turn against democracy and radical democracy. Because to call for solidarity in the ethical sense which I just outlined is to call for treason. And it is inconceivable why the new anti-democrats, such as Zizek, but you and their followers, also the Invisible Committee that authored the coming insurrection, consider their own revolutionist Big Bang theories more radical than a call for treason. This is all the more surprising as in their accounts politics, politics tends to disappear completely. And this brings me to my third consequence, the consequence with regard to the notion of politics. For instance, actual politics... Um, disappears in what one may call the fantasy of grand politics. When Badiou, for instance, recommends fidelity towards a rare and grandiose truth event, which a subject may encounter once in a lifetime, like Paulus did on the road to Damascus. Or, according to Zizek, Zizek's narrative of grand politics, Lenin, by seizing the revolutionary opportunity and intervening in a situation that appeared premature, had thrown himself into the, that's Shishek's talk, into the abyss of the revolutionary act. Then I think there is a highly problematic aspect of this narrative. And this problematic aspect is not only that Shishek returns to a grotesque, Kim Il Sungish version of the larger than life revolutionary. So as if it was Lenin's lonely decision which in the end affected the revolution. And by the way, I assume that Lenin himself would have denounced such idea of politics as a clear case of Blanquism and adventurism. What is problematic is that politics is thereby based on the phantasmatic idea of a total break or rupture with a given situation. What results from this is a politics of the political, of a direct and unmediated instantiation of a new ground. Thereby, the difference between politics and the political is collapsed. And this is explicitly claimed by the Invisible Committee in their manifesto, where they make a plea for violent insurrection as an instantiation of the, they call it like this, purely political, a purely political uncompromised by ordinary politics. And I find this very disturbing. I submit that with fantasies like these, we rid ourselves of all intellectual and political gains of post-foundationalism and of the political difference in particular. The fantasy of grand politics appears, it appears, is fueled by a double disappointment. On the one hand, many on the left are disappointed by the deplorable state of conventional politics where the neoliberal consensus has broadened to an extent that makes it difficult in the best 
to detect any difference between political parties. On the other hand, what has been called micropolitics where the slightest act of individual subversion is already considered political, is not feasible, is not a feasible alternative for many social movement activists today who indeed want to act politically, not micropolitically. In other words, there is a new sense evolving that acting politically means, in actual fact, acting collectively. It means acting strategically, it means to confront a rather complicated formation of obstacles and inimical powers rather than a dichotomous relation between the revolutionaries and the state as the new anti-democrats portray the situation. Here we have the state or capital or whatever and here we are, we are the activists or the revolution or the anarchists or whatever. And it implies the necessity to organize. And this leads me to the last consequence, a consequence regarding our very understanding of what it means to act politically. The criteria just mentioned, it's only one page, the criteria just mentioned stenographically make up the categorical nucleus of every politics that I assume is worth the name. These criteria, in a sense, constitute the minimal conditions of political action that are Collectivity, strategy, conflictuality, organization might come up with even more uh, minimal conditions. Of course, such notion of politics does not necessarily follow from the political difference. But it offers a description of our political world which is much more plausible than the ideas of either the nostalgic defenders of revolutionism or the romantic proponents of micropolitical subversion. From this perspective, politics is not about taking a blind leap of faith. It is a process of acting in a contingent situation on a terrain of imminence, crisscrossed by a plurality of antagonisms. While there will always be, of course, a moment of adventurism involved in the Shishakian sense, for ob obviously in politics one always takes a risk, strategic considerations necessitated by the manifold obstacles one encounters, <coughs> such strategic considerations remain an intrinsic part of political action, which is why people like Machiavelli or Gramsci have something to contribute to the concept of politics. And this is exactly also the reason why I think that it is of political importance to cling to the difference between politics and the political. We need a notion of the political understood as the ontological moment of an initial grounding of the social, a moment with which as such and contrary to what, for instance, the Invisible Committee seems to think cannot be reached but we also need a notion of politics because the moment of contingent foundation will always have to be actualized and reactualized through ontic practices of ordinary, rather or quite ordinary, political action. The latter, interestingly, has not received sufficient attention in the debates on the political difference. Where there is a lot of discussion going on about the sublime nature of the political, interest in actually existing politics is negligible. But we have to understand that as a consequence of the chiasmatic, the intertwining nature of the political difference, the ontic side of politics is of as much importance as the ontological side of the political. Consequently, we have to develop a more flexible and yet determined notion of politics. A notion of politics not anymore afflicted by the question of scale or of intensity or of the unconditionality of a revolutionary act. In contrast to today, ideas of grand politics and micropolitics, I submit we can meaningfully speak about politics whenever and wherever the minimal conditions of collectivity, strategy, conflictuality and organization are met, no matter how big the collective, how effective the strategy, how intensive the conflict and how good or bad the organization. 
a renewed reflection on politics will have to rehabilitate the smallest political acts and the most modest achievements, which are provided the conditions are met as political as the greatest revolution. What we need, in other words, to capture a world filled with less than grandiose political actions is a notion of what I would like to call minimal politics, which is politics in a rather straightforward sense, but on a minor scale. Minimal politics can be found all around us all the time. The political difference, understood as the ceaseless play between an ontologically retreating ground and an imperfect ontic attempt at grounding, may remind us of this and of the fact that even the biggest political upheavals, as we see them for at least three years now, even the biggest political upheavals will be supported by little actions in large numbers. So thanks a lot.